Logo Centrifugal Podcast. I'm Chance Lunsford. I'm also Logo Centrifugal. I'll let you make what you can of that. You might even be Logo Centrifugal too. I'll, ma- I'll let you make what you can of that. And while you do, while you're pondering the nature of your reality, let me introduce to you today a guy who's going to <laughs> make you ponder the nature of your reality. I have with me Mr. Nick Hinton. Uh, I say that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I figured, but you know, maybe it's Hinton. Okay, so. <laughs> I did so, study French. <laughs> well, that, that makes you half French then, right? <laughs> <laughs> so so look folks nick is a guy who um i had seen a little bit of your stuff on twitter and then justin said hey i know a guy um who would be an interesting guest on your podcast and i said okay well who is it and i, and I started reading through your threads I was like oh man this guy's um number one i used to have a thread of threads in fact i've had a thread of thread a couple times so i was like okay well <laughs> this guy's this guy's clearly spurging out so i can get along with him that way and then and number two, um, it wasn't as though you're like, you should totally believe my conspiracies. This is just the way it is. Like, no, here's some things you might want to think about. I mean, I don't know. There's something There's something weird here. You figure it out. Right. Um, and so I thought, yeah, okay, let's make it happen. And so we did make it happen. And, and now here we are. Um, but beyond that, you know, I don't know a whole lot about who you are and what you do. So why don't you pick it up from here and um, let me and the audience know a little bit more about you, man. Um, I'm Nick Hinton. I'm a 24-year-old philosophy student at the University of Toledo. Um, I, I'm minoring in business as well. Um, and I'm an artist. I'm a poet, a musician. Um, you know, I just, I look at myself as a creator and a thinker. And that's basically it. That's basically the best way I can describe myself for you. So. Okay. So, um, that... That might be the the second worst introduction someone's ever given themselves. <laughs> <laughs> my bad. <laughs> but, but, no, no. But the worst, the worst, uh, the best worst one is my friend Roman McClay, and and people love him. So I think I think you're starting off right. So look. Okay. I mean, I don't want to like hype myself up to this big thing. I just you know that's that's really all I know about myself. <laughs> Hey man, that's a pretty honest take. That's a lot more honest than a lot of people would uh, would admit to. So <laughs> I can I can get down to that. So look, I I really want to give you the chance to um, to kind of dive into stuff. But um, why don't we start at the beginning and and maybe talk about your sense of time, and and we can kind of move on from there. Because you know I was looking at uh, some of the stuff you've done on time. Um, and it's interesting and there's a lot of different theories about time and the nature of it and if it exists at all or in what frames it exists and what frames it doesn't and this kind of stuff. So I wonder maybe, maybe kind of take us down that rabbit hole and we can, we can jump off from there. Okay. Um, I mean, so you're probably referring to the thing that I posted today, which was just, uh, you know, I don't believe that there's any real moment other than the right now. And I think it was Alan Watts who made me uh, think about it in this way, the way that I wrote it today, is that there's no other time than now because when you're thinking of the future or when you're thinking of the past, you're, those moments only exist right now. You're bringing them forth in the now moment. So when you're thinking of the past, you, know, you can only, the past can only be real right now because that's the only time you can remember. You can only project your future or think about the future or imagine what it'd be like right now. So. And yeah, you can remember things, but it's just weird to me that it, that it can only be right now. And so I don't, I really don't know. Like, that's why I really love to write because it's so much easier to flesh these like very complex things out into like a coherent, organized thing. And it's like, when I start talking about it, it just turns into a mess because these things are so like confusing, you know? Um, but yeah, so the other things about time is that, you know, I think that it's part of, the simulation theory, I guess, you know, are part of the Saturn theory, you know, that their time is an, a linear time is unnatural. That's kind of what I believe about it. You know, I think real time is cyclical and, you know, you can even see patterns in your own life that kind of go in year or five year, 10 year patterns. And, uh, yeah, I, I think that reality moves in patterns. And so time is just like kind of, 
this limited lens that we that reality is filtered through and things kind of like actualize through that lens but really it's the seed or the or the egg and like the full grown human all wrapped in one and so time is just the way that that manifests into the full thing like plato i guess would say that's like the per the world of perfect forms kind of echoing down into our reality so we see all the stages but it's really just one big i don't know if that makes sense if you're following no yeah i'm yeah i'm with you right here so okay you know uh, what I was kind of thinking about when you were talking about the, you know, this moment being the only moment, I mean, it's certainly the only moment that our consciousness can embody itself in, you know, you can sort of travel these, like you talked about, you can, you can go to the past in your mind and you can just sort of like bring things and there's something inside of you and there's this chain of events that, that suggests that you actually were there and that those memories are yours, but you, you know, maybe that's just what this thing needs to believe in order for you to exist as you are right here in this space. It's, it's hard right. to say. And it's like, a, it's like the hourglass sort of with the past and the future, you know, and the only place you are is just right there where the sand flows through You're the yeah, constriction exactly. in the sand. And you're like, here I am, man, I'm pinching the sand. Yeah. That's you a good know, way so of looking at it. Why don't you run with that? Yeah, that's a great way to look at it. But um, yeah, I think that memories pretty much just give us a sense of continuity and um so like <clears throat> one of the things that people keep you know bringing up to me one of the things is that they always want to talk about like the beginning of the universe or how the universe is going to end and stuff like that and i'm like honestly i don't know if there was a beginning what like i kind of think that right now is always the beginning and the end you know it's like it's always fluctuating you know it's it just exists right now so there is no real beginning of the universe and if we are ever to figure out the beginning it might already be different. You know, there's retro causality, like time is this very fluid thing. And we, we tend to look at it as, you know, solid, like what happened in the past has to have happened in the past. And that's the only way it could be the past will never change and blah, blah. So yeah, I, it's almost like the, I heard someone talk about how time and the universe, like the, the beginning of the universe till now and through history is kind of like um, the wake that a ship leaves behind. Like there's little trails of it, but you know, eventually it disappears and there's more trails, you know, that keep manifesting as, so there's like echoes, but you know, I don't really believe that there is a full, like a full on solid beginning moment. It's just always been and always will be. And that's because it's, it's God. It's the thought of God or something like that. Hmm. So there's, there's, there's a lot in there. And number one, you know, you talked about cycles and we do measure our time in, in cycles, you know, it's not, it's not that we don't even measure it in a linear fashion. You know, we're repeating the same days over and over again. This is December. Yeah, exactly. This is July, you know, this what year? Well, I don't know. You know, we sort exactly. of just arbitrarily so, like <laughs> the planets going around the sun in a circle. Where's the beginning of a circle? Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, and then to kind of add to that, there's, I'm, I'm from Utah. I was born and raised here. And the Mormon church, this is, this is Mormon church AQ, HQ yeah. up in here. And Joseph Smith is an interesting dude. He had some problems. He had some very remarkable things about him. And one of the things I've always liked, it's called the King Follett uh, Discourse or Sermon. And a guy died working in a well, digging a well. And it was one of Joe's friends. And he, he talked at his funeral. And he started to reveal this Adam God theory which is pretty interesting in itself but one thing he said is that you and i brothers and sisters are the same nature as god the eternal father because we're eternal he didn't create us we're not literally his children we're the same nature as him because if 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 at any point you are eternal that means you always were eternal there is no beginning there is no end you've always been here you have always been who you are god the eternal father is just the the most intelligent mind among us and so he was unanimously elected to set the pattern and the pattern was a man comes to a planet and embodies and lives a perfected life and then dies and is resurrected and sets a new throne up and continues that process forever and that every one of us is intended to do that and however you think about that i that piece of that the eternal soul you know it's it's uncreate because it is a fundamental piece of eternity and without it eternity wouldn't be what it was and you're a part of that and when you you know if you think about the universe in those kind of terms like if it if it is eternal 
if existence is eternal, then you being part of it also means that you're eternal. And if it isn't eternal, then, then like, where, where did it come from? You know, you start getting to those questions right. where you're like, my mind just broke. And, and I guess I wonder, what do you do when you run into that wall? Yeah, it gets so hard to talk about. Yeah, I mean, this is something that I've been talking about the last couple of days, like with professors and stuff. It's a weird theme that's just been going on is that language is so limited when it comes to talking about these things. And yeah, it's it's really difficult to talk about these things. But um, I like what you said about the about how we are all a piece of the eternal and we're, we're all the same nature as the father and, and uh, we're kind of like going through this perfection evolution, something like that. And um, someone sent me this poem called The Egg and I really, really loved it. Have you ever read it? I don't think so, no. It's basically about how God, we're all, so to make a long story short, we're basically all God being reincarnated over and over and over and over and over again until we finally evolve into God. So like every individual life on this planet taking place right now is God and you are every single person. And re throughout eternity, uh, given a long enough time, you will have reincarnated and lived every single other person's life on this planet. And some of these people, they evolve into like, you know, masters like Buddha or Jesus. And then these, you know, and then like in Buddhist cosmology, there's like divine beings and then they evolve into God. And so basically the whole world is an egg and, you know, it cracks open, take life to something totally new. And that's what's going on right now. So according to that poet. Yeah, that's a lot like a book I read that I found in my father's basement when I was starting to allegedly experiment with psychedelics. And I was like, what the hell is this? Cracking <laughs> the cosmic egg. That sounds far out. And it was, it was kind of essentially exactly what you're just talking about and, and looking at it from a consciousness standpoint. And there was also one of the Don Juan books in there from Carlos Castaneda, which I don't know if you've read those, but that's a, that's like, that was like the starter kit for trippers back in the day. <laughs> I guess that's yeah, neither I, here nor there though. But I never really tripped that much. Everyone always asked me, they're like, dude, like you must trip a lot of, like you must trip balls all the time. Like, dude, no, not really. I, I mean, I don't even remember the last time I touched a drug like that. Well, some people need them to see, and some people already just kind of go there naturally, I guess. Um, yeah. So look, man, I was listening to you saying just a minute ago that you've been talking about these themes a lot the past few days with professors, and they're just kind of a subject that's coming up, and here we are sort of just diving right into that right now. And I wonder, what do you think is behind those sort of synchronous events or that zeitgeist effect or that, do you think there's some sort of cosmic consciousness that's, that's doing that or cosmic consciousnesses that are, that are sort of manipulating the way that we're experiencing these thoughts simultaneously? Yeah, I do. I, I believe that reality is kind of like a feedback loop between the subjective and the objective. So, you know, whatever you're putting out, you're going to get back and based on what you get back, you know, you're going to reinforce that by thinking more things about that. So like, you know, if you think you're poor, you're going to see things that are like, oh, I'm poor. And so you're going to see that. And then you're going to, you know, it's a feedback loop. So you're going to keep thinking that. So if you're constantly, I, I honestly think that if you study profound things, you just become profound somehow. I think Jordan Peterson said, some, said something along the lines of that. And that's what made me obsessed with just reading and studying. And um, so I, I think that when you're downloading all this information this mind expanding information you know the universe kind of just like opens itself up to you it shows you the illusory nature like it just you know it welcomes it hmm. and so when you're on that higher vibration i guess not it's not in like a way that you're better than anyone anyone can access these higher vibrations of thought but when you're up there you know your thoughts will affect reality easier i guess and so if you're thinking about you know, a book that you just read, you know, because you're more in the flow, you know, you're more in the natural flow of things, you, you know, you're going to naturally see more signs. Maybe because your eyes are open, you see signs. Maybe there's signs around people all the time. Their eyes just aren't open. Hmm. You know, there's always the example brought up of to, to sort of keep going with what you're saying. There's always the, you know, like you buy, you buy a white Subaru and then suddenly there's white Subarus everywhere. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's often suggested that, well, 
the white Subarus were always there. And I was like, well, maybe, yeah. maybe not. M- you know, maybe there was something that just happened that brought white Subaru, the form of white Subaru into existence in this, in this like portion of the realm right now in a way that it happened all at once. Maybe there really are more of them. It's, it's really kind of tough to say because you didn't notice them. And it's, it is true that when you start being aware of a certain thing and you start to notice it everywhere, and you go, oh, this is like a, it's like a layer of reality that I wasn't tuning into. And now right. I am on that frequency or I have access to that frequency. And the thing I find interesting, and, and maybe uh, I can tie this into more of, of some of the work that you've been doing is it's not as though you just have one frequency, you know, it's a collection. Mm-hmm. You, you, like you start as a baby and you just see like, Oh, this is like, I have access to this like glob of stuff. And then it starts to take shape. And, but you still have, like, you still understand it's like, this is a glob and then this is a shape. And then what shape is it? And then what color is it? And what does it feel like? And where did it come from? And who gave it to me? And where did they come from? And where did, Whoa. Okay. And then you sort of always run into that wall, but I guess what I'm curious about. Yeah but you have access to all those layers and you don't have access to the higher ones until you figure out how to get there. And I like to say that I I learned this from a guy, but it's never a what it's always a who that gives you access to the next level. But in sort of that light, you know, a lot of the threads that you've worked on talk about these abnormalities that seem to arise. Like, like for example, the um, statue of Liberty one where it's like, well, is it here? Is it there? Is it nowhere? These pictures are weird and the society is weird. And like, what, what the hell is going on here? And there's, there's, there's lots of stuff like that. And so I guess I'm wondering like how much of queuing into that vibration of maybe like even this, this statue of Liberty exists at all. If it doesn't exist, it doesn't even show up in your picture in your world or like, you know what I mean? Like, I wonder yeah. how much of that do you think is actually real versus a psychological effect or, or even if how much difference there is between those two classifications? Yeah, um, I truly don't know if, um, you know, if any of these theories are for sure real. I mean, we don't even know if the accepted theories are real. It's so crazy to me. I don't, I truly don't know. We're just so limited in our ability to think and our perceptions like obviously the perception of the statue of liberty is screwed up regardless if it was there or if it's just a glitch or if it's false memory or something like that you know it's always just limited perception and so i think the only reason i noticed you know you're talking about synchronicities and finding abnormalities i think you know the only reason i was able to find those things is because like seek and ye shall find if you're looking for crazy corners of reality you will find them you know, for some people, the Statue of Liberty is just a totally normal thing. And then for people, you know, in third world countries, they don't even know it's there. And it might not exist for them because, you know, if a tree falls in a forest, does it make a sound? And my answer to that is no. Because if there's no observer, then there's no reality there. So. Hmm. I had a guest on this podcast recently named Beth Martins. And one of the questions that she offered up was to ask yourself, who's trying to find me? And the reason I bring that up in the context of what you just said is like, you know, if you're looking for the weird corners of reality, reality has a way of looking back at you. And I guess I just wonder when you, when you go out there looking for this, like, okay, like gravity bends reality, you know, and it, and it bends time and it bends light and it bends all kinds of stuff. Like there there seems to be this, you know, like, and then there's this, this dip in this bowl. and, And then is there anything sort of in that where that fabric was that is now embodying that space but but also you know so there's but then there's your mind level like okay i'm bending my mind in this certain way like i'm looking for the abnormalities and the weirdness and then you know what kind of observer comes into those spaces to view you is you're looking at things from that oblique angle because you know when you fall into a when you fall into line with the rest of people in the line it's, it's like, oh, I see the person right in front of me and I can feel the breath of the person in back of me and I sort of understand what's going on here. And everybody around here seems to be playing by the same rules. But if you step out of line and kind of like, why are you guys in line? And wait, where's this line even going to? I mean, you know, like what kind of response have you seen as you've maybe stepped out of line to ask some questions about it? Um, well, you're talking about when you're looking for things, things are looking for you as well, right? that's part of it. So 
I think honestly, a lot of people are looking for me. Um, and that's honestly the intuition I had about this whole, whatever I'm doing, this mission, this, this uh, hobby, I don't know, you know, I, um, I literally just wanted to like, some, see, some people are complaining and saying like, this isn't original. I'm like, I know, I know it's been said before. I'm just trying to freaking, you know, boil it down into very simple, short, easy to read threads, you know, that anyone can understand. And it, all the information isn't all over on these different links, you know, like some people don't have the time to freaking do that. <laughs> some people understand what you're talking about right away. Others don't. So my intuition was that I'm literally doing this for the people that are, have had a bunch of dots come into their awareness, but then they kind of just like let them go, stop thinking about it, or just don't even know where to start to connect them. So I think I'm there for the people that have already been finding dots, but just don't know how the bigger picture fits together. So I'm just laying that out, you know, for the people that I've already been seeking. So seek and ye shall find. They've been looking for the bigger picture. I think they're being led my way. And I'm looking for other stuff, <laughs> more stuff to give them, I guess. Hmm. That's interesting. The way that you framed it with the dots. And um, when you said that, I instantly had this idea of like, okay, let's imagine that there is an idea. And, and, and you have this awareness that's sort of like sonar, right? That, that picks up new ideas, let's say. And it's just like, boop. Or something and then maybe the next high you know like the next level of resolution is somebody just like caught a glimpse of it or and drew it like a like a like a stick figure picture like look at this this is kind of mm -hmm. what it was and you know it could be a monkey it could be a man it could be bigfoot it could be like whatever and then and then you know the next one is like a picture just one still frame you go oh well yeah but it's kind of it's like yeah and then maybe somebody catches like a crappy film and then, and then you get high resolution, resolution video. And then you have like a conversation with this thing. It's like, oh man, look at this. This is like, it really, I never knew it was, existed. And then I kind of was convinced. And then now here I am in the presence of this thing. And I'm like interacting with it with all my essence and my senses and things. And I guess I'm wondering, where do you see what you're doing on that level? Like, are you, are you maybe like the snapshot? Are you like the crappy home video or are you the... You know, where do you think you fit in with that sort of journey along the way to, to a new understanding of the way things work? I think right now I kind of have like an old shitty map. Hmm. And so we have like the X's on the map, but we haven't really gone there yet. And I, that's kind of exactly how I see it. And I, I'm there. I have some X's in mind, not necessarily with conspiracy theory. Like there's directions I want to go in my life. And I feel like this framing of reality that, you know, you can create that gravity bending with your mind that you're talking about. You can find synchronicity to help you flow through life. Those things are helping me find my path, you know, to the X, to that goal. And that's for me as being a creator and an artist and a philosopher. Why, why is it a map in your mind? What, what are you drawn to maps for? Or like, what is it about maps that draws you to them? I just, I've always liked that term map of reality. I always write about maps of reality. You know, I'm always trying to create one. Like last year, in, uh, I think it was inspired by psychology class and religion class together. Like I, I think reality, I mean, there's plenty of maps, but one of them to me, I think is shaped like the monad, you know, the, the Jungian circle and the dot, I think that could be like a map of the earth and a map of the psyche. And in both cases, you know, have you seen the North Pole thread? <laughs> in both cases, then the magical shit is right at the center. Yeah. You know, there's this, there's this interesting thought about the center of the earth that it's, that it's like a crystal crystalline form you know like a, yeah yeah and a magnetized crystal and that from out there you know that's sort of where the ley lines are yeah. formed is sort of by the you know the shape of the crystal and everything and there's even now a lot more uh, like scientific evidence to to suggest that that might be the case that there really is this giant crystal at the center of the earth um and i'm going to bring a little mormon theology into it again because it's just an easy frame of reference for me because of childhood indoctrination. But, <laughs> but um, Joseph Smith talked about when, when Jesus Christ reigned supreme on the earth once more, that all of the soil 
and all the dirt and, and all the uncleanliness will be swept aside from our bodies, but also from the earth. And what will be left is a pure crystal that's of such purity that you'll be able to see all the way through the earth. Um, Holy and I just, yeah, I just always found that like a badass idea. Like we're going to be cool. sitting here yeah. glowing, you know, on this crystal planet with Jesus. <laughs> like that seems like a pretty cool vision, man. I could get, I could get on board yeah. with that. <laughs> um, but I always find it interesting and it sounds like you probably do too, that, you know, like I, I fell away from my religious upbringing and then I went and did a lot of re religious study in my twenties to try to get my mind around what I really felt and believed. And in the end I kind of figured out, well, I don't know, man, <laughs> there's a lot of shit out there and I'm not sure. I'm just going to kind of think about yeah. it and, you know, and I'll choose to be a believer because I feel better about it, but I don't know. You know, I'm agnostic. That's kind of how really I'm too, man. Yeah. <laughs> I just choose to believe in Jesus, but I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I guess my point with that is just that I have found it very interesting to see the parallels in basically every system of thinking that I've ever dived into, whether it's Buddhism or the Quran or Christianity or, or Judaism, or like even some of the darker focuses, they all seem to revolve around the same themes, even if they don't approach it from the same angle. You know, like yeah. there's, there's these orders of existence and there's these ways of either connecting or disconnecting from the little like bubbles of godhood that are floating around you. And sometimes it's like, boy, oh, now we're joined together. Or sometimes it's like, no, cut all of those ties. And that's sort of the essence of Satanism. It's like you're, you're a lone individual and you should do everything you can to make sure that your singularness is never infringed upon at all by anyone and the, the ultimate goal of course if you follow that logically is total isolation and then what happens when you're there i don't know but and then the other is the other extreme is sort of like total connection total connection and and, and like inseparableness but then you start to wonder like well if that happens then do i lose out on my individualness totally at that point if i'm if i'm fundamentally connected and so like is that what this existence is? Is sort of trying to figure out where you, where you even want to be in that balance? Like, does God, uh, okay. So, so there's a no, lot of I those get levels. It. I was going to say <laughs> both, both of those perspectives, ultimate connectedness or ultimate isolation, depending on who you are, both of those could either be heaven or hell. It's crazy. Exactly. You know, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I truly believe that your perspective is what shapes the world and maybe even shapes your afterlife. If you've ever read the Tibetan Book of the Dead, I think it is, you know, it talks about, well, actually, no, I'm not even going to go there. I'm going to talk about Aldous Huxley and the Doors of Perception, because he talks about how he kind of references the Tibetan Book of the Dead, but um, he basically says that the light that you see, like, when you die, he's like, what if that's the same light? What if it's, depending on how you look at it, it could be the, the glow of hell. Or it could be the light of heaven, you know, and just depending on like your thoughts and emotions, that's, you know, that's the way you'll perceive it. So if you leave this world as like an angry fucking, you know, just a jerk, you know, you're going to be scared to die and be scared to let go of the material world. If you're like ready to go, you know, you're going to welcome that light. You know, when I was young, my grandfather uh, was not in very good health. He was a very kind man and he worked his ass off his whole life and um, he was able to provide my grandmother's dream life essentially and, and help out all his kids financially when they were entering adulthood and he did everything he wanted to do. Uh, but he was sick a lot, you know, and um, the last few years of his life, he was just kind of zoned out. And he was very intimidated by the thought of dying. He'd, he was a man of faith and he held that faith right up to the last second, undoubtedly, but he loved, he loved this life and he loved his wife and he loved his kids and he just, he wanted to be here with them. Um, and I sometimes think about that, you know, like when you die or when you're approaching death, it, it seems to be universally sort of, you know, you have that fear, even if you're, even if you're devout your whole life and you have that faith, it's like, well, you know, I knew all along that I had this faith and now I, I don't know what's going to happen. And, you know, I've heard a lot of things. Real the moment. Yeah, exactly right. And then you get there. But one thing I found in my life that sort of helps me is just the, it's like, well, if I live right now as though I'm already in heaven, you know, then I sort of have that momentum of like, well, 
my life is as good as I make it. And if, and if that's the rules now, maybe it's the rules always. And I just understand how to make that work for me more. But I guess I wonder, what do you, you know, like, do you think that this life, cause we talked about cycles and we, we kind of talked about the nature of existence and stuff, but I wonder, do you think this life is sort of singular in its uniqueness or its essence? And, and even if we are this infinite God that, we just get the one time to embody this one space and this one meat machine and that that piece of the puzzle is then set and you just move on. Or do you think it's just all, all the time being rehashed and replayed over and over again? Or, or where, where do you kind of come down on that? That's intense. Um, I don't know. I think after this, you know, you go to a singular afterlife and you know, there may be other people there that, you know, or you don't know, but literally that's still going to be a projection of your own mind. And I, I think that's almost the meaning of, you know, build up your riches in heaven. So like what you do on earth and the beliefs and the feelings you cultivate, is like literally what's filling up your psyche. So when you get up to the afterlife, the astral, I believe it's in the astral realm. When you get up there, you're going to project something pleasant. You know, that's what you'd hope for. So you build up your riches in heaven before you get there. But even that will still be an illusion that will still be just a projection of your mind. And that's what I was getting at with the Tibetan book of the dead. They say when you get to heaven or hell, you know, you can go through infinite hells or infinite heavens, but the basically you're supposed to just continue to go inward, just meditate, still ignore everything outside of you. And I'm no monk. I don't even freaking meditate anymore, but I need to, but I, I, I tend to believe that anything that's external can be boiled down to illusion. So even if you're in heaven, seeing people, you know, it's weird. It's still a projection of yourself, which means that it's, it's real. It's part of God because it's part of you. It's so confusing because I'm sure everyone else has their own perspective to go through too. And maybe they're not even there. Maybe it's, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like a solipsist view, but also yeah. there are real people. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, and that's, that's one of those things that, that sort of lends credence to the idea that the external is unreal because it seems to be a combined Reality, you know, the reality you interface with seems to be a combined effort of manifestation of all the people around you, you know, and all the people that existed in whatever the past might be. You know, you're standing yeah. on a mountain of bones of your ancestors, and it's like yeah. a pretty tall mountain by now, you know. It's like, wow. And this capacity that we have right now to essentially in real time talk to each other from wherever we want to in the world. It was unimaginable even just 20 years ago. You think like the you know like a, a video call <laughs> i don't think right, so right. timmy you know like that was like, like james bond yeah exactly they have watch. ubiquitous yeah, and you can do mm -hmm. it on your watch even too you can I mean, it's, it's it's incredible and all these things that we had in our imaginations and we thought you know that's that's going to be 30 it's going to be 30 30 it's going to that's going to be in the year 10,000 it's like no it's yeah no, it's like two, 2010 bro <laughs> it's just a couple of years away we already right. imagined it now we're just ushering it in and I guess I wonder, do you, where do you, where do you think the limitations of that power of imagination and manifestation lie? Or do you think there are limitations or, and that temporal aspect too, you know, like the, the gap or the, like the resistance from inception of the idea, then it crosses that barrier into reality. Then it crosses that other barrier into like common acceptance. Like this is going to be here forever now or some version of it. Yeah. Um, I, I honestly, I kind of don't believe there's a limit. You know, Einstein said that the imagination is the, it's like the preview of the coming attractions in reality. So like, you know, we watch science fiction and that's the preview of like, it's, it's creation of the imagination, but it's literally a preview of what we will create eventually because we're already creating it now. You know what I mean? So like we're creating it in the movie now, not just the fact that we have cell phones and holograms and all that shit. We're like literally creating these ideas and they will manifest. And especially the more that they're put into the collective unconscious, you know, people are watching all these science fiction movies, but um, yeah, I don't know if there's a limit and maybe that's a part of our ascension or evolution, you know, who knows what's going to happen if there's a, you know, I think there's going to be like two possible paths of evolution. You know, one is going to be very materialistic where we, maybe merge with AI and we're in a simulation type universe where literally we can do anything. People will want to live there. And then, you know, maybe there's the spiritual side where, you know, you reject all technology and then you can literally do anything because you are in a higher 
space. And then maybe both are the same, <laughs> you know, the singularity. Yeah, you know. <laughs> The thing I think about when I think about the simulation theory is just like it seems it seems almost certain to be the case in some in some way you know like the the whole religious situation that somehow this existence especially in the in the judeo christian sense that this whole existence is some sort of manifestation of divine will. It's, it's like the yeah. exact same nature as I have an idea and then I think about what it needs to be done and then I get the pieces and put them together and now here's a thing in reality. You know, I took the clay and I molded it and I breathed some life into it and, and now here's this thing and it exists now and it didn't before or did it, you know, because like I had this idea right. and it was a form and then I, and I just breathed life into it and I have the, right. you know, that's, that's the thing I really hope people cue into maybe here about this conversation because this is kind of an odd conversation. I mean, not yeah. for me and probably not for you because you're thinking about these things all the time, but it's like, okay, what the fuck are they talking about? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But every person who's listening to this podcast has had in their time or in their lives a situation where they thought, that's a cool idea. I'm going to do that. And they, and they, all they had was an idea. You know, they had, like Aesop Rock says in one of his songs, it only takes a dollar and a dream. You know, they had this yeah. idea, and then they brought it into reality, and it was not there before, whether it was something they wrote, or whether it was something they built, or whether it was something they wanted to have in their lives. And they did whatever it took to bring it in, and they changed the reality and the nature of their experience with it forever. Everybody's done that. Everybody does that basically every day. And so, I guess, I just, I'm trying to... I'm trying to get my head around the idea, and I guess we all are in a certain way, but what do you think the source of that is? Where do you think that comes from? And do you think that sort of, that, that power, that, you know, like that divine spark, do you, think, do you think that our reality really is sort of just like another one of those things? Like some mind had the idea to bring this existence into existence, and now here it is, and we're experiencing it like do you think god made his own playground and then jumped in and split himself infinitely is that do you think kind the cosmic of think, egg yeah. is yeah. yeah 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 i kind of really think that i think that we are literally all i mean this is alan watts this isn't my idea but like literally we're all god playing hide and go seek with himself and so he's so good at the game that we forgot who we really are that we're all <laughs> one yeah. we're all one literally and um it is all the mind of god so people are like they always talk about doing god's will or doing their own will even when you do the wrong thing and you're maybe you're not even aware of it, or maybe you're doing it in spite, regardless, not saying to go out and be a bad person, but regardless of what destiny holds, I think whatever you do is the will of God, because however he made you that what you didn't decide your preferences, your dreams, your desires, your situations or anything that you were born into. And you don't even really choose the information that you come across that changes you as a person. So I do believe that everyone has is a, like a puzzle piece and even their thoughts aren't their own. You know, we don't know where our thoughts come from. They just kind of blip into our head and then we're like, oh, that's fine. It's not we're just an observer of them. We identify with them. And so that's where the monks are. They're like, just quit, just quit thinking or just watch your thoughts pass through your head and ignore them. Because like, I think that's where we're all the same is the thing in your head that says, oh, I'm thinking right now. That's the same for everyone. The thoughts aren't the same, but that thing that's able to see yourself thinking, that's the same for everyone. And that's that piece of crap, the observer, the witness consciousness hmm. the brain is like this organic computer that just thinks things and churns out codes and shit and we just like oh that's me that's me that's me that's me it's not we're just these we're just this piece of consciousness that is a part of the puzzle he's got sitting in this organic computer this robot organic robot artificial intelligence that's just walking around and doing shit because it all has to happen for the the drama to play out all the, all the world's a stage hmm. so there's a couple of things I maybe want to chuck at you based on what you just said. Um, so, so number one, like let's, let's assume that we are all a piece of God or are all gods or, or, or something along those lines. If that's the case and free will exists, then, then what you're looking at is 
Like you get to decide the nature of God, at least part of it. You know, like here I am and I'm Chance and you're Nicholas and I'm just the piece of God that I am. But depending on my character and my attitude and my actions, I contribute to the nature of God. Like is God a benevolent being? I don't know. Depends. Are people benevolent? He transcends that, I think. Transcends good and evil. Light and dark are two ends of the same totem pole. You know, are two ends of the same pole, not totem pole, but it's a, it's the same spectrum, light and darkness. And even Nikolai Tesla said that, uh, you know, darkness is the true nature of light. We just haven't discovered that yet. I mean, outside of our skull, it's all dark. We only see light because that's the way our brain interprets frequencies in this energy field. But, but why? Because if, if, you know, like if this whole thing is a machine, that's like a play machine and it's, and it's got, you know, like playing this game and, and splitting this consciousness up into infinite variety and just, you know, Alan Watts idea of playing hide and seek and being perfect at it, <laughs> just like everything yeah. else. Okay. So, so, but why is that game designed for us to see things in such a way? You know, why, why the dichotomous nature and why, and why the seeking for the light why the seeking for the higher ground rather than the seeking for the lower ground there's something intrinsic about that i think and i always my favorite book in the bible is genesis i love the book because every time i have every time i go back to it it continues to reveal things just little words or little tweaks it's like oh i didn't see that part before and one of the things that it talks about is okay so you have you have the void and on the vo- void is the waters and God's spirit f- floats upon the surface of the waters. Then it brings the firmament up out of the waters. But there's, there are signs to indicate that that's like a level, but there are multiple firmaments and multiple waters. And so what, the reason that I bring that up is like, you know, a monk going to the mountains and saying, I'm not going to interface, you know, like that's creating part of a God that doesn't do anything just sits back and, and, and like, like, let's say that you created a video game and then no one ever played the video game. That doesn't seem ideal to me. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah. and so I, you know, and, but, but like, imagine if you do seek the light and then the old light becomes the new dark and then there's something above that, you know, and then you kind of, have you ever seen those? Have you ever seen the, like the frequency boards with the sand on it and at a certain frequency, yeah, yeah. it's a geometric pattern. And then it, yeah. you know, it falls apart. And then it comes back more complex. And that's what yeah. I see is, is the difference between the light and the dark and why we're cued in to view things in that way is because you can come back as that next pattern if you can push through the chaos in the middle. You know, it all falls apart. Everything falls apart. And it has to, right? Because there's limited material or there's, you know, like it's, it's set into a thing and then it has to fall apart and then it sets into the new thing. And it looks like in the middle that there's no sense to be made of it. But if you keep going, boom, suddenly it's this amazing thing right in front of you. And then, oh shit, it fell apart again, but boom, now it's an even more complete, perfect existence. And yeah. so I, I mean, I guess I just wonder your thoughts because we're kind of closing down the time, but, and I just dropped a, one of those things that you could talk about forever or for not at all. So I guess do as you will with that. <laughs> well, creation is, uh, destruction is a part of creation. And so like I was saying, it's two sides of the same pole from a far away perspective. You're like, Oh, that's two things. Like, Oh, that's or maybe from very close up. You'd say, Oh, that's two separate things, you know, looking down and looking up. But you know, if you look far away and you transcend the idea of duality or good and evil, you're like, Oh, those are both necessary to create this experience of separateness. So, you know, you need creation or you need destruction to have the creation of these beautiful things. You need the bad to appreciate the good moments. You know, that's cliche, but, you know, we all know that. And um, you made me think of a really funny idea, though, with the monks. I was like, I wonder if what monks are doing are like, in a sense, glitching the matrix. Because think about it. If you had a bunch of people play Fortnite and every one of those 100 characters decided to just not do anything, what would happen? (laughs) What would happen? Who won? What do you mean, win? <laughs> right, right, right. Would the game just freak out? <laughs> Maybe the monks are all just waiting for us to catch on. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'd like to see that happen just as a, like, listen, we're, we're accepting you into this monastic tradition, but before you do, we just had a little experiment we want you to run. Right before you become a monk, please log into a game of Fortnite and then uh, <laughs> let it go. 
<laughs> we'll we'll jam the servers. What if what if suddenly uh, the demiurge was like, uh oh. Yeah, he's like, oh shit. They got this one figured out. Wipe the slate. <laughs> All right, it's it's forty two. It's the year forty two again, or whatever. Uh, new game. <laughs> Remember, Simon think, says. <laughs> some people think uh, the way to to reset the matrix or whatever is finding that crystal thing you were talking about. This one dude I was talking to, um, super interesting guy. He thinks that the Spear of Destiny is like the code name for that crystal or whatever, or maybe just a piece of it. And if you can interface with, with the, the world mind, you can actually bend reality to your will or something like control destiny. That's what spirit destiny was supposed to allow you to do. So, but the problem is, is that people who find it have too much of an ego and then it gets corrupted. Hmm. That's what he thinks. And maybe that makes sense with the story of Atlantis because they were like trying to create these crazy technologies and then, it, you know, they were, they were too impure or something, you know, they couldn't handle the technology and then Atlantis fell. And so we're kind of coming around to that same cycle again. Maybe we're creating a new Atlantis with CERN. You know, they literally call CERN the Tower of Babel. Like scientists say that, which is just fucked up. There's there's a lot of weird stuff going on at CERN, man. A, some 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 weird people got pretty deep into physics and got good at it. That's, yeah. that's what it seems to me to be the case. And and maybe just one final thought on that crystal idea, like. There's this thing called, I like to call the buffer zone. And that's another thing I picked up from a guy named Kurt Duncan. But you have your thoughts and then you have this resistance before your thought becomes reality. And the reason is because you're shitty and you're responsible. Like if you're driving down traffic and you're like, fuck that guy, I want him to die, explode. And then he explodes yeah. immediately. It's like, that's not good. You know, that's not a good reality. Reality to be done so fast. Like imagine the day you're having, you're like, man, I just wish everything would die. And then just, it, oh, existence is over. There's a reason that there's that buffer zone. And, and I wonder, right. you know, like, Maybe the earth, the earthy earth, maybe that's that same sort of buffer zone. It's just like dense, thick, you know, we're just, we only get these little wiggling vibrations that make it out of the center of the earth to like shift things a little bit. Like, oh, now we're entering the Mayan age. Oh, now we're entering. <laughs> but it's this like very subtle. And if we were just like right next to the crystal, we'd be like, boom. Oh, obviously there's this new phase change. Like what if the vibration board is at the center of the earth, but then it just like only just little little teeny vibrations make it out to manifest into our existence because if it happened so fast, maybe we as humans would fall apart. We can't hang. Psychologically, we can't hang. Um, right. It's, a, it's you know, the, the, the other cliche, spiritual new age belief that we're in like a, a school. Maybe we're just learning to con hone our, you know, hone our powers, you know, make them a little bit better, get a little bit better controlling our minds before we get that instant, whatever you think you create. And, you know, People that ask to project and do that kind of stuff, they say it happens faster there. So, you know, maybe the farther up in the realms that we go, you know, the vibrations are less dense, so we're able to manifest faster. So, you know, the more, if we evolve spiritually and we keep going up through these different worlds, maybe that's what we're being prepared for. But then, once again, I still think that everything outside is an illusion. So the whole school game could just be another deception. It's just like, wow, now you're distracted by something else. You, got, you figured out these fun toys called the brain. And it's still a distraction. Hmm. You know, <laughs> <laughs> given the nature of this conversation, I think that's a pretty good place to start winding it up because we got your time concerns going on here too. And I definitely want to be respectful of that, especially yeah, if you wouldn't, wouldn't want you to fall asleep in class. So <laughs> <laughs> We, we talked about sort of, you know, we started with time and we just went all over the place on the nature of existence and weird things that can happen when you start thinking about these things and, and sort of the nature of reality and a God. And it was pretty, like, there's a lot for people to think about in there. Um, but let's say somebody was sitting in front of you and they said, man, man, Nick, that was, that was some shit. And I, I resonate with a lot of those ideas, but I'm not sure where to even start thinking about it. Like, I feel like there's something important in there, but I'm not sure where to start looking in order for me to be able to grab something. And if somebody was just kind of like, what, where, where should I start, man? Like, what should I start looking at to maybe broaden my awareness a little bit? And they were sitting in front of you asking you that, what would you tell them? 
Dude, I don't know why I'm pushing this guy's book so hard. Like, I don't get paid for it. I don't even know the guy, but I love it so much that whenever anyone asks me, I say the same thing to everyone. I'm like, please just read Becoming Supernatural by Dr. Joe Dispenza, because that is about all of these types of things, the illusory reality, the quantum realm, the power of the mind, all of it wrapped into one, but for a positive benefit, that we can literally change our DNA, that we can literally heal our bodies, that we can literally create the circumstances that we want. And, you know, all of the above, like just crazy stuff. And he's a, he's a doctor, he's a scientist, he's a neuroscientist. And, um, you know, there's testimonies and documentations in there and it's so fascinating. There's people literally with horrible diseases that are just, you know, experiencing spontaneous remission, you know, from prayer and meditation. And it's awesome. And so that's, a, that's, I think, what's the benefit of all this is that if you realize life is like this magical dreamlike thing, you can do anything you want. But still distraction, you got to become a monk. But we will worry about that later. So say the name of the book again. Becoming Supernatural by Dr. Joe Dispenza. Okay. I have one more challenge for you too. And it's, it's no big deal. But uh, what is one question that you think people should ask of other people? And what's one question that you think they should ask of themselves? <clears throat> that they should ask other people first? Either way. Who am I? <laughs> and then maybe, it sounds stupid, but you know, how can you help? I mean, it sounds cliche, but how can you help others? And you know, people are gonna probably roast me and say, how are you helping people? You're making people afraid and scared. That's what some people have said to me. But I really believe that like all of this information is just, it's deprogramming. It's breaking down that box that you live inside of. And like I said, at the bottom of the rabbit hole of all this dark and scary shit is the fact that you're an eternal being. That's what matters. Hmm. Reminds me of that tool lyric. Remember all this pain is an illusion. <laughs> yeah, I was just reading those lyrics the other day, actually. Yeah. Yeah, there's been a lot said about Maynard, but man, do I appreciate the fuck out of that band. I'm pretty excited <laughs> for tomorrow. <laughs> so look. Um, why don't you tell the people if they're interested in learning more about, you know, what you do, where they can find you on the social media, where they can find you, wherever you want to let them know. If you want to say hello to anybody, that would be a great time, but here's your chance to say, here's where you can find me. <laughs> All right. You can find me at, um, N I C K H I N T O N N on Twitter and Instagram and YouTube is N I C K H I N T O N N three, three, three. And I haven't really started doing much with my youtube channel yet but the interesting thing about it is that i was doing a vlog series where i said i'm going to manifest becoming viral on twitter and now it's happening so it was supposed to be a documentation of uh, like manifestation and self-transformation and that's what's cool about it is that it's proving that the power of the mind and law of attraction works so you can find me on youtube instagram twitter i don't really care about anything else i guess you know my book's coming out soon if you want to order that you can um yeah, I'm hoping to release music soon. I'm hoping to be traveling around doing more podcasts. And eventually I'll make a movie about this crazy shit. And that'll become a monk. Hmm. After you've, after you've uh, fulfilled all your desires and attachments, you'll <laughs> let go of them all yeah. and finally retire to the mountaintop and just watch the world go by. Yeah, exactly. Once I decided I had enough. Well, that sounds like a decent plan, man. As long as, like... If you want to let it go, that's fine, but get some shit done first, please. <laughs> so look, uh, if, if you've, is there anything else you feel like you need to say or are you good? No, I think that's all, man. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, that's the last thing I wanted to say too, is thank you very much for taking the time to come and share some of your thoughts. And you know, this has been an interesting conversation. I didn't, I didn't know a whole lot about you before, um, other than you kind of had these things going on and, and now I see the man underneath them and I, or maybe over the top of them. And I, I like you, man. You're, a good guy to have a conversation with and I appreciate you taking the time to, to come talk to me and to offer this stuff to me and the listeners and you know come on back sometime let's have another conversation and uh, dive into some more mysterious nature of reality shit hell yeah I'm definitely down for that man cool well until next time then this has been the Logo Centrifugal Podcast I've been Chance Lunsford he's been Nick Hinton this has all been allegedly and maybe it's all illusion and we're out <laughs>